The Apostle Paul told unbelievers really good news that leading Christian teachers can't even speak. This guy, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy, all leading teachers in Orthodox Christianity can't even proclaim to unbelievers the same great news the Apostle Paul proclaimed. But I can. They, unlike Paul and me, are all enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus said very clearly that he came to save the world, including those who have no place for him in this life. That's good news for all of us. Jesus speaking in John 12, 47 through 48. And if ever anyone should be hearing my declarations and not be maintaining them, I am not judging him. For I came not that I should be judging the world, but that I should be saving the world. He who is repudiating me and not getting my declarations has that which is judging him. The word which I speak, that will be judging him in the last day. Jesus said, I came not that I should be judging the world, but that I should be saving the world. He included the ones hearing his declarations and not maintaining them, the ones repudiating him and not getting his declarations. My Jesus, the biggest Jesus, is good at everything he does. He didn't fail in his mission. He saved the world, the whole world. Jesus told his father that he would glorify him on the earth by finishing the work his father gave him to complete. John 17, 4, Jesus said to his father, I glorify thee on the earth, finishing the work which thou hast given me, that I should be doing it. Did Jesus lie to his father? Did Jesus glorify his father by saving the world, or did he tarnish his dad's reputation by doing a half-assed job? And Jesus exclaimed from the cross in great agony, it is finished. He did it. He finished his work. He saved the whole world. He took away the sin of the world. Jesus said, it is finished, but these four enemies of the cross proclaim, no, no it's, it's not. not. They deny his finished work and proclaim that Jesus didn't save the whole world. Who are you going to believe? Because these four men proclaim a Jesus who failed to finish his work, they can't proclaim the same great news the apostle Paul proclaimed. So what did Paul say to unbelievers that these four men can't say because of their bad beliefs? Paul, writing to the believers in Ephesus, reminds them of when they heard and believed the word of truth. Ephesians 1.13 In Christ you also, on hearing the word of truth, the evangel of your salvation, in whom, on believing also, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Before we dig into this verse, let's first see the order of events that lead up to someone believing and being sealed with the Holy Spirit. Paul reveals this order in Romans 10, 15 through 14. I say 15 through 14 because Paul actually gives the order in reverse in Romans 10. Romans 10, 14 through 15. How then should they be invoking one in whom they do not believe? Yet how should they be believing one of whom they do not hear? Yet how should they be hearing apart from one heralding? Yet how should they be heralding if ever they should not be commissioned? According as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those bringing an evangel of good. Before God grants someone belief, Paul says, first, someone is commissioned, meaning sent, to be bringing an evangel of good, a.k.a. the good news. Then the sent one heralds, meaning proclaims the evangel of good. Then someone hears the evangel that is proclaimed. Then someone believes the evangel that is proclaimed. Someone is sent, then that someone heralds, someone hears, then that someone believes. In our Ephesians verse, Paul reveals two of the steps in the process. He reminded these Ephesians that they had previously heard and believed. Then God had sealed the believers with his spirit. The focus of this video is on the content of the evangel, the great news the unbelieving Ephesians heard from Paul. Paul reveals a key element of the good news he proclaimed to the unbelievers in Ephesus. He reminds the Ephesian believers what they heard before they believed when they were unbelievers. Paul spoke to them the word of truth, which contained the evangel or the good news of your salvation. They had salvation salvation before they believed. They actually had salvation before they even heard. Paul proclaimed your salvation to unbelievers. Those who believed the good news of their salvation were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Not all unbelievers who heard the good news of their salvation believed it. Let's see how this may have played out in real life. Hey guys and gal, how's it going? Eh, right, pretty good. You're cute. Has anyone told y'all about your salvation? My salvation? That doesn't sound horrible. Go on. Cool. God sent his son, Jesus, to take away your sin, and he did it. 
He took away your sin and the sin of the whole world. He saved you when he died for you. He was placed in a tomb. Then God, Jesus' Father, saved him out of death three days later. Boring! I'm out! <laughs> Idiot! He did that for me? I have salvation? Wow, that's so cool. I'm Gigi. Gigi heard Paul's good news about her salvation and believed it. Then God sealed her with his spirit. Her belief was in Jesus and the fact of his finished good work for her benefit, even while she was a sinner. She didn't rely on her faith to save her because she knew Jesus already did. What happened to the salvation of the two who didn't believe Paul? Their salvation was real before Paul even talked to them because it was not based on them, but on the already finished work of God and Christ in Jesus' death and resurrection. And it was still there and very real even after they walked away in unbelief. Their salvation is just as real as the day Jesus took away their sin, along with the sin of the whole world. They will begin to benefit from their salvation just like Gigi when God grants them belief just like he did with Gigi. God may have granted them belief later in their lives, maybe not. The salvation Jesus secured for all of us has no expiration date. Nothing can undo his finished work for us. Our salvation isn't dependent upon our belief or unbelief. It's dependent upon the work God and Jesus already successfully finished 2,000 years ago. You may be wondering, how can an unbeliever have salvation before they believe? How could their salvation exist apart from their participation before they even hear the truth about Jesus? Isn't our salvation real only after we've made it real by bringing it into existence by our belief? Yes. These are great questions. Understanding the three aspects of salvation is essential. Much of Orthodox Christianity only knows of and proclaims two aspects of salvation. Most proclaim God and Jesus didn't save anyone by his death and resurrection. The Calvinists actually do acknowledge the three aspects of salvation. Yes, I do. But they say the three aspects are only for the elect, those who believe in this life. Yes, they are. This is false. That's why Calvinists can't preach like Paul. A Calvinist can't say to all people, have you heard the good news of your salvation? No, I can't. Because they don't know who the elect are. No, I don't. They don't know who Jesus saved 2,000 years ago. Correct. Again. The Calvinist doesn't even know for sure if Jesus saved him 2,000 years ago. No, I don't. Oy vey. Let's see how aspect one of our salvation was accomplished by God and Christ. When God placed all of the sin of the world, past and future, into Jesus' body, and he died, all our sin was taken away and condemned. And when that happened, the whole world was saved. The whole world was given salvation. Salvation was deposited into everyone's account. That is how Paul could talk to any unbeliever and tell them the good news of your salvation. Please get this straight in your brain. The good news of Jesus is not an offer. It is an announcement. It is an announcement of the fact of your salvation because of what God and Jesus successfully accomplished for your benefit 2,000 years ago, long before you were even conceived. God is not offering you salvation that you must finish by believing. You don't have to finish what Jesus only started. He finished it. Assume Hitler didn't believe before he died. What happened to his salvation that God placed into his account? Did it vanish? No. Does it have an expiration date? No. In heaven, neither moth or rust or thieves are a problem. Hitler's salvation is still there for his benefit and will benefit him when God grants him belief like he does with all other believers. In a long back and forth interaction in the comments section of my recent debate video, I told an Armenian, Nathan Couch, who goes by the YouTube name at Darth Nocturnus3941, about the salvation in everyone's account because of Christ's work. He wrote, and I quote, There is no money in the account. <sighs> Let's now take a quick look at aspects two and three of salvation, which we can also see in the book of Ephesians.
Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 and 430. In Christ, you also, on hearing the word of truth, the evangel of your salvation, in whom, on believing also, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is an earnest of the enjoyment of our allotment, the deliverance of that which has been procured for the laud of his glory. And do not be causing sorrow to the Holy Spirit of God, by which you are sealed for the day of deliverance. Paul revealed aspect one of salvation when he told the Ephesians the word of truth, the evangel of your salvation. This aspect of salvation was complete before they heard and believed. We see aspect two of salvation also in verse 13, when we see the unbelievers believing the word of truth, the evangel of your salvation. At this time, they were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. This was an earnest of the enjoyment of our allotment. The Holy Spirit they were sealed with was the earnest, the deposit which guarantees the future fullness of the Spirit. While in aspect two of salvation, the believer begins to enjoy some of the benefits that come with his salvation, like reconciliation with God. God, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control, Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the believer is still capable of sinning and dying because he has not yet been fully delivered by being made immortal and incorruptible. Aspect 3 of salvation is the deliverance of that which has been procured by Christ, verse 14. This will take place in the day of deliverance that we see in 430, when believers will be made immortal and incorruptible. When they experience the fullness of their salvation that was procured by Jesus, no more sinning and no more dying. All three aspects of salvation are accomplished for us by God and Christ. They save us. We don't save ourselves. Jesus died for us, accomplishing aspect one of our salvation. God grants us belief, accomplishing aspect two of our salvation. God and Jesus make us immortal and incorruptible, accomplishing aspect three of our salvation. So, you may wonder, how can an unbeliever have something and not even know about it, or have it and not believe it's real? This illustration may help. In my line of work, I locate unclaimed money from various sources. Often, I'm dealing with tens of thousands of dollars, sometimes hundreds of thousands. And in this line of work, there are parallels to the three aspects of salvation. Here's the real-life example of Jack. I found about $50,000 in unclaimed money. As I dug into the case, I saw the judge said the money was Jack's, and the court was ordered to send him his money, but they couldn't find him. So the court held the money for Jack. After some digging, I did find Jack. I called, sent texts, emails, and letters for about eight months, telling Jack the great news of his money, but I got no response. One day after about eight months, Jack answered my call. He said he'd received all my previous communications about the money, but didn't respond because he didn't believe the money was real. He thought it was a scam. Something I said in our phone conversation, however, convinced him it was real. Several months after, it was already real because of the judge's decision. Jack's realization was simply him believing something that was already real, acknowledging as fact something that was already a fact. His belief didn't make the money real, it was already real, and according to the judge, it was Jack's money. We completed the paperwork, then I went and got the money for Jack. Two months later, Jack received his big, fat check. Here's how this example parallels the three aspects of salvation. The first aspect of salvation is like this. The day the judge said the money was Jack's and the court held it for him is like God saying salvation is ours the day Jesus died, and God holds it for us in our name. It's ours in our name whether we are aware of it or believe it or not. The second aspect of salvation is like this. The day Jack believed my words that the money was real and it was his is like the day when an unbeliever believes his salvation is real, his salvation that was already accomplished by Jesus. The believer in Jesus receives an earnest of the Spirit when he is granted belief, and he begins to enjoy the benefits of his salvation, like hope and peace. When Jack first believed the money was real and it was his, his outlook changed. He now had hope and peace that he didn't have before. The third aspect of salvation is like this. Jack's day of deliverance was the day he received his big fat check and can fully enjoy his money. Likewise, in our future day of deliverance, we will enjoy the fullness of our salvation when we are made immortal and incorruptible by God. Most of the government entities that hold people's unclaimed money are very lazy and put no effort into finding people so they can get their money. The true Savior is not like that. 
He came to seek and to save. Locating people so they can benefit from their salvation is not hard for him. Don't worry. All who have salvation will believe in and benefit from their salvation because God and Jesus know where they live. If you don't believe in Jesus, I want to tell you about your salvation, the salvation in your account that God is holding for you. Your salvation is real because Jesus died for your sins and took them away, all of them. Then his father saved him out of death three days later. Believe it. Salvation is yours. If you're a believer and you desire to tell others about their salvation, I encourage you to use Paul's words when telling them the good news. Hey, have you heard the good news about your salvation? You'll probably get a variety of responses. Some will want to hear more about their salvation. Just point them to the finished work of their Savior, which is the only way an unbeliever can have salvation. Thanks for tuning in. I encourage you to watch this video next to see how the salvation of all by God in Christ precedes judgment.